This is how people experience life at street level. We have interactions with other people, we have activities, we go places, we do things. Everything is a detailed living and experience. And it can seem quite personal, the things that go on around you, because, well, they are personal. They happen to you, the person. But our perspective is not the only perspective in the world. From the perspective of every other person in this planet, it can be seen differently. From the perspective of all living things, whether it's plants, fish, animals, birds, everything has its different perspective. As humans, we choose what perspective we are going to take on something, whether we look at something in a positive way or a negative way, whether we even look at it at all. That's actually called free will and choice. And even though there are those that are in Australia that would say that in Australia we have no free will and choice, every person has that in every moment of their existence. What we think is our free will. Sometimes our choices may be limited and that is with good reason because no matter where you go from no matter which perspective you look at it we are not on this planet alone we are here with other people other living things so we cannot make all the choices only about us some of the choices we have to make have to consider everything else around us so of course when we choose as adults we choose whether the things that we do whether they will affect other adults or other people or other living things in a negative or positive way these are the choices that you can make how you interact with others and how you interact with the planet and all other living things on it people get caught up in their day-to-day -day lives and some find comfort in focusing only on that stability that they have created for themselves. But if you take it from a larger perspective, we are all living on the one planet. We are subject to the laws of nature and the laws of nature are about change. They are not about things staying the same. Everything cycles in nature. So when you try to set up a life that you control every facet of, you are actually going against the natural cycles and forces of nature. And eventually, your inability to adapt with changes will see you fall hard. We live life in the perspective of two constants, day and night. We live with the inability to see in the dark. So when we do things in the dark, we need to create artificial light. Because unlike all of the animals around us that have no problem seeing in the dark, we do not have those adaptations. So to expand our world of experience, we create and we create and we create. And we have created a lot throughout the whole planet. But as you live your life from one perspective, from day to day, and you look at what's going on around you, at night, you can have a different perspective. The nighttime perspective can offer a completely different look at the world. When you are sitting on this planet, looking out at all those bright little lights in the sky, all the different colours of them, 
how they move. And you can sit there and you can wonder about whether someone is sitting on a planet somewhere looking up at stars wondering the same thing. I wonder what's out there. So as day turns to night you can change the perspective the way you look at life. You can realize that you are just a smaller component of something slightly bigger, a community, maybe a suburb, a city or a town that's part of a state, that's part of a country, that's part of something that when you zoom right out is just a little ball in space. Like all those other specks out there. To those specks, would they even see Earth? Or would they only see the sun because that's the brightest thing? How close or far? So when you look at life from the perspective that we're all on this one little ball floating through space, you actually start to look at more bigger pictures. What's important to the planet and to all life on it. Now there's lots of politics that go around, you know, certain things that I'm not going to raise. <laughs> but you do raise certain subjects and people have got very strong views on that as human individuals we are responsible for so much catastrophe that nature already cycles through and has done for millions, billions of years. And there have been changes to those cycles through mini ice ages, massive ice ages, long ones, short ones, glacial periods, interglacial periods. And in fact, when I was in school back in the last century, we were taught about how we were existing in the longest interglacial period in history or our known history that they'd been able to find out and that we were heading into an ice age. These are the natural patterns that they had identified and that's what we were taught at school. That we are in the warmest interglacial period known in human history. So if it's the warmest you would expect it to get warmer than any other previous pre-ice age interglacial so that when it does go into an ice age well what will that look like and here I am talking about things that I wasn't going to talk about <laughs> but anyway as all things cycle on small scale to larger scales to long term scales that there are like comets that we know of that we'll never see in our lifetime simply because of their cyclic period. So there are cycles we will experience in our lifetime and ones that we can only be a small part of because we will not live that long to get that perspective of the differences, what it's like. You can only take a short little snippet. So when you look at the perspective of life on this planet, how it is comprised of not only billions of humans, but trillions of other life forms, plants, animals, birds, fish, microorganisms, so many different things that exist on this one planet. And yet it seems to be that the biggest problem we have is when we get down to the street view and people can't see things from a different perspective, from a larger perspective and how they affect things on the whole. And people think, well, I'm one person, I can't do anything to change everything that goes on on this planet. And that's where people think that if you've got a big problem, you need a lot of people to object to that big problem to change it. 
But that's not how change occurs in the planet. All change that occurs throughout history has its seeds in very subtle actions and thoughts and choices of all the individuals that make them, that culminate to a certain point in time. If you've got people that don't speak out about anything and they allow things to be done to them and just go along with it, yeah, I'm cool with that, well then they wind up at a place that others chose the path on rather than making those choices yourself. So the more people that make their own choices on what they want to be a part of creating to ripple out into the rest of the community so that that empowers others to stand up and do the right thing, to be a part of life on this planet and to not be segregating and saying, well, because it's not happening right around me, I can't affect any change. Every single person on this planet has the capacity to affect change as they uniquely can. And it may not necessarily be around you immediately. It may be something that, that you are that touches somebody else in the they stop and think about something. It changes the way they feel about themselves. Then they start dealing with others in a way that it ripples out. This is how you change the big things. Not by trying to knock it over with a sledgehammer, but by dealing with everything at the level where it can make a difference. There are so many issues that people raise that you can't make a difference to it. The only thing you can do is make a difference to the future with your choices now. And how you walk your talk affects other people in a positive way that they then too do exactly the same thing. And the decisions that the society around you starts to change because the people that make up that society have grown and become better people and they make different decisions because they see things from a different perspective. How we affect change around us to the betterment of all people is where we put our focus. Realising our strengths and weaknesses and where, as a unique individual, you can best help this planet, other people, and help move things towards not just talking like <laughs> some people do about, oh, you know, what we need to do is change, we need to be this, and all they do is talk, talk, talk. Well, be the change. Put your focus where you can help. Now, where I'm positioned, I have been keeping a close eye on what's been going on in the Tarkine with the um, big conglomerate Chinese involvement wanting to go in there and destroy all this uh, beautiful, beautiful um, wilderness area. And, well... Much as decades ago, Bob Brown was in there saving the wilderness areas, he's still doing it today. And I've been keeping a close eye on it, thinking this is some dedication. It's the middle of winter in Tasmania, and 71 people have been arrested, and more than 400 people have been on the front line in the Tasmanian winter. Now this guy up the trees right now, he can tell you where they are, they're looking at minus of a night time now. Some, they may even get snow depending on you know what the wind is going to be like. But right now I can tell you outside, I can't even see the street light down the road because there's that much fog. So I could only imagine what all of these people on the front line stopping the bulldozers 
from going in and putting up a tailings pit which will only contaminate the the waters and destroy the wilderness even more so the focus that all of these people are putting into this the heading of this email that i received was people people power prevails so it's not that I'm located here, you think, because I believe in this, that I would be out there doing what I can. I'd be part of those 400 people. But I'm also realistic about what I, as a human being, uh, can actually achieve physically in those sorts of conditions now. I mean, if I was a lot younger, I'd be out there doing it. I could very easily physically do it. However, I give my hat off to Bob Brown because he's older than me. He's out there in amongst this. He was actually one of the first to be, well, I'm not sure whether he was arrested. I'm pretty sure he was in a pre-dawn raid by police. Uh, this was uh, several weeks ago now. So there's been an ongoing battle because four, more than 400 people focused their attention in one place. But all it needs is for people to focus their attention where they can help, where they can help other human beings. And this is how we affect change. This is how you bring people together and make changes in your community, that then the community makes changes to the local laws. The local laws make changes to the state laws. The state laws make changes to the federal laws. This is how you change things. Not by taking on the big things that, you know, David and Goliath. You act. Walk your talk where you can help others do things. Now, I suppose one of the reasons why Nightcap on Minjimbul actually attracted my attention was from decades of seeing destruction to habitat. This guy up here, up the tree here, Nightcap on Minjimbul intends that currently the best part of 240 acres of natural bush, this is not the plantation eucalypts, but natural bush would become open spaces. 240 hectares of all of this, all the trees would be removed and it's turned into open spaces. Now this is supposed to be coming from the same mindset that is supposed to be doing exactly what this guy is doing, protecting the bush, protecting the wilderness, stopping the bulldozers, stopping the chainsaws, stopping the mining companies, stopping the gas companies, and stopping the, the taking of bottled water from local resources too, but that's another subject. So there's all these things that Nightcap or Minjimbal represent to say that they are for the environment, do no harm. This on the left here, what Bob Brown is doing in the Tarkine, is do no harm. That's walking your talk. What they intend to do over here in clear 240 acres or hectares of trees, sorry, is that I wonder how much 240 hectares of natural timbers is worth? How many millions of dollars? I'm sure they've already calculated that, which is why at the UKI meeting about the development that Dean Rodimer brought up the biggest selling point was how much money they're going to make out of the timber not preserving natural heritage, not preserving the wilderness, not doing no harm, but how much money they're going to make out of chopping down the natural trees. Well, you know, Bob Brown's a little bit busy with what he's got going on in the Tarkine, and so are other people who have got their attention focused on that. So anything that I would contribute to that is not going to achieve any greater success. 
So I put my attention, my focus, where I can help and I can make a difference. Now if we further consider what it's like to have different perspectives, Nightcap on Minjimbal would have you believe the do no harm philosophy that they're coming from this perspective over here. That it is a reality and a perspective that is not only just taken, but they walk the talk. There is the preservation of the wilderness, not further thought of destroying it and how much money you can make out of doing it. Now the perspective of most other people on what they want to do at Nightcap is to, at the edge of all this habitat and through this wildlife corridor here, they would, well, all of this over here, all those trees there, that would all be bared up. 240 hectares of destruction of natural habitat. I repeat, this is natural habitat. This is not any of this plantation eucalypt over here. And when I say just, it's just koala food. So even though it is plantation, it is, and it has created its own unique ecosystem, it is still an ecosystem that is a valuable part of the koala's habitat and other animal and flora species that do exist within that plantation area. Now the recent changes that were made to the capital expenditure for Stage 1 in DA21-0010 indicated that they wanted to put in 125 streetlights up here. Now the thing about the country, when you look out at the dark night sky, it's you can see it because there's no light haze. 126 or 125 street lights along here is going to create light pollution, light haze. And the more there is, the further it will affect people by getting the light haze of a night time. You will not be getting, well, what you'll be getting is a light haze that blocks out a lot of what you can actually see in the night sky. And you might say, well, big deal, but that's actually part of the appeal of why people actually like the country and why they don't want a city, well, half a city, that Nightcap on Minjimbal proposes, with streetlights that would destroy it for everybody. And when you further look out, this area here being lit up, there's lookouts around the area that people go to of, you know, they drive through there over night time, they stop and they look at that beautiful dark, you know, skyline and the stars in the sky and they just soak in that, that beautiful atmosphere, except for something that is lit up like a Christmas tree over here because it's got 125 streetlights. Although I'm a little bit skeptical that they would actually work effectively because one of the mountains is actually translated is cloud catcher, which means that it would be covered in cloud a lot, which means that your solar panels are not going to absorb much solar radiation when it's getting blocked by cloud. So cloud catcher and solar power don't really go together that well. Now I think that anyone that's listened to any of Nightcap on Minjimbal's main philosophy is do no harm. And yet from most other people's perspective that's to do harm is all that they are proposing to do 
to harm the environment, to harm animals by disturbing them. Uh, so many are going to end up dead. They're going to end up as roadkill because there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of cars. The animals won't be able to avoid all of them. It's going to harm so much. And, you know, the, the, for people that understand, that say that they understand the philosophy of do no harm and how important preserving the natural bush is, they are doing everything opposite to it. It is not this dedication I see out of people that are walking the talk. This development over here proposes to pretty much strip the land of resources. As much of the natural timbers that can be sold off, they've calculated 240 hectares. And I might point out that a large portion of that is actually part of people's exclusive use lots. But then there's further natural bush that would need to be cleared around each lot having to have an acre cleared around it. So there is a lot of profit to be made by stripping the land bare of the natural timbers and selling them off, which again is another reason why Dean Rodimer's main focus at the UKI meeting was how much money is to be made by doing that. From the perspective of the developers, they can't see what the big problem is. Why people have got a problem with it. Why won't you let them do what they want to do? They're not, they're not going to do any harm. They've said they will do no harm. Isn't that the sales pitch? Do no harm. Getting back to nature, getting back to heart. True volition. Isn't that what Adrian Brennock spills? Well, he does spill a lot of things. They all do. And that's what salesmen are good for. But salesmen are also good for uh, mm, exaggerating the truth or perhaps even making it up to sell something. Because, well, let's face it, if they advertise Nightcap or Mingenbull as, well, Adrian Brennock gets up there and says, oh, look, you know, this is wonderful, blah, 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 blah. And, um, oh, do you want to invest in it? He's done all this sell. And then he goes, oh, by the way, I've got to tell you that I'm an undischarged bankrupt. Do you still want to invest? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, the marketing ploy that is employed by every single business out there for crying out loud we all get sales brochures we've all seen tourist bro brochures I mean how many people have you looked at the tourist brochure and you went there and you never saw any of that it didn't look as good as that it wasn't nowhere near like that and they made it sound so exciting but it was really quite boring and not worth the trip yeah so it's a promo, a sell. And even though they called their official documentary, <laughs> it's not a documentary, it's almost an hour-long ad to sell Nightcap on Minion Book. And one of the things that I think that is especially noticeable is that here they are talking back about getting back to nature and true volition and everything. I mean, and everyone knows that nature has got a name. She's called Mother Nature. So if you really actually wanted to sell people on the Mother Nature, getting back to nature concept, you need to bring in the feminine touch. And I'm sorry, it is just completely and lacking in authenticity to get back to Mother Nature without having the feminine touch in there. Now that would also give, in a, if they'd done that in their ad, had feminine representation, some kind of 
feeling that there was a balance between male and female and that a community is family friendly, that it is supportive of all walks of life. Uh, it was strongly masculine, the advertisement. An hour long advertisement was, well, if you take out the political campaigning and the political opinions and how they can, like Adrian Re uh, Brannock likes to um, take the dictionary and redefine words to the way he wants them to be interpreted, as they all do. Mark Darwin did it, um, well, probably still does do it. Mark McMurtry does it. I mean, the thing is that when you do actually use words out of the dictionary <laughs> that have got a meaning, you should actually know in what context to use them. And that's, uh, yeah, that's something I'm going to do in another video because uh, unlike Mark McMurtry, I'm not myopic. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I think that um, that was very well highlighted. But that, as I said, that's a joke. If you haven't seen the a current affairs story that aired on Nightcap and Pete Evans' involvement in it, and well, Adrian Brannock especially too, as an undischarged bankrupt, why Pete Evans is ignoring all the best advice from those with a perspective that is actually coming from do no harm. No, Pete Evans doesn't want to listen to the perspective of do no harm. He's like all these others that he's got in business with at Nightcap on Minjimble. It's all about the money and how much money they can make out of it by, well, essentially, I tell you what, the day that you get a DA approval for stage one and after you've spent $38.9 million, let's see if stage two for you to actually live there and build there would ever be able to be submitted because the Tweed Shire Council have removed themselves from the state environmental planning policy and only the local council laws will apply which prohibits rural land sharing communities. So you will not be able to submit a DA for that. So that's just if you're not myopic, like Mark McMurtry, you're not lacking <laughs> foresight. <laughs> Sorry, that was just the best part of this show. You know, I, I actually thought that it was such a well presented um, trying to bring a lot of complex issues in under 10 minutes. Wow, I can't do it in under 100 hours. <laughs> it seems like that's how many videos I've done on it anyway. Actually, I have done probably more than that. But anyway, so just, well, I did this video to remind people that where you put your attention and where you focus things and from the perspective that you're holding is how we, each and every one of us, contribute to the greater change around us in the community that affects further out, that ends up changing policy. When I first saw Bob Brown come onto the scene well, last century, <laughs> he has not changed in his determination because of his focus to protect the wilderness. And there, well, in some ways, Australia and the rest of the world owe him a huge thanks for his focus and determination. So it only takes one person that then others then become focused on the same page and this is how changes occur. But if you sit back and you don't do anything where you can act, 
that makes you as bad as those that you would complain about. As I said, walk your talk. Be part of the change that you want to see happen around you. And focus your attention where you can help others. And it might not necessarily even be in the same state you are living in, like me. Because I can best help others by focusing my attention on, well, through my own experience and what I understand about what's going on there is why it raised red flags for me in the first place and why it should raise red flags for any normal person and why, as was pointed out by a current affair, why weren't the red flags raised with Pete Evans? Well, they were. It was raised with Pete Evans on multiple occasions. His choice to ignore those issues is because he's greedy. He's more interested in the money that he would make out of it than do no harm. It's not like you've got to go to church to learn it, is it, Pete? Okay, I will do it briefly before I finish up. This is the story that aired, well, two days ago. And it, quite funny, actually, but... <laughs> What uh, Rodney Cullerton uploaded on Twitter with what Pete Evans edited from his own recording and video, I dare say, gave a little bit of a different slant on things. I loved it too when um, Steve here asks Pete, um, as soon as he mentions Adi Adrian Brannock's name, Pete turned tails and runs. And as, oh yes, this was here too, let's have a look. Steve did an, a, ra a phone radio interview with Ray Hadley and mentioned how Pete Evans was so nervous and it was like, yeah, well, that's pretty obvious. But he said his, his left hand was shaking like an outhouse in a gale, and I thought, oh, was it? I must have missed that. And sure enough, you go back, just as he's driving through the, um, oh, he's up here somewhere. I think he's opened the, the gate, and he's about ready to go th drive through, and he's standing there holding the phone in his left hand, and yes, it is shaking, <laughs> as Ray said, <laughs> like an outhouse in a gale. <laughs> so yes, it was a completely different uh, perspective that Rodney Cullerton and Pete Evans had jointly put through on the Gap page on Twitter that he was, you know, in control and dealing with it. No, the most he had to say was enjoy the fake news. It's not fake news that Adrian Brannock is a bankrupt and that Pete Evans has got involved with them. It's not fake news. It's advertised all over their website, for crying out loud. And Pete's also got a link on his website for Nightcap. He's done a video promoting it. But I love the way that he tries to plead ignorance because he didn't do half an hour running around trying to get away from them from his yoga <laughs> when his zen was ruined, that he wasn't on the phone madly trying to find out, oh, what do I say if they catch up with me again? Well, the best thing he had was to bring up a completely unrelated subject and try and attack on that, and then put out a short clip that made himself look like, hey, I honed him. <laughs> I'd say by Pete Evans' shaken left hand, he was the one that got honed. <laughs> Great job to the team at A Current Affair. And if you haven't read the article that Luke Mortimer has done that's gone with the interview that Steve Marshall has done, then I do recommend reading it. Excellent article that uh, does go on for quite a bit raising points that weren't actually raised 
on the actual uh, current affairs clip itself. As you can understand, there's only so much you can do in the format and the time available. So there's a little bit more detail and a job well done uh, by Luke Mortimer and the team that uh, produced all of this and have bought what was going on at Bulla Bulla that morphed into Nightcap and how, well, unfortunately there are more people set up for a fall now than there were at Bulla Bulla. So the longer this goes on, the more people that will get hurt. It's as, it's as simple as that. I don't see the Tweed Shire Council allowing such destruction of habitat and the wilderness area. Their focus is very much on the wilderness area, culture and heritage. Now the thing being is that what they're proposing at Nightcap infringes on all of those philosophies within the Shire. So, and the council have already stated that their recommendation, even though it's gone to the Northern Regional Planning Panel, their recommendation that goes with that is that it not be accepted on merit. Or well, lack thereof merit that even under the one policy that allows them, the state environmental planning policy. Just a brief 10 lister on the breaches that they cannot conform with, that they, sh they need to be in line with to even be considered for approval. So no matter who the authorising body is, whether it's the Northern Regional Planning Panel or the Tweed Shire Council, they cannot give consent because it does not meet the guidelines. Now from the developer's perspective at Nightcap, they have tried everything to silence anybody's opinion, their right to free speech, by threats, legal threats, intimidation in other manner. Well, as you can see in the video that if you click on the top, it'll take you to the current affairs story. You can see the hired thugs that Nightcap on Minjimbal have to protect Mark McMurtry or anyone else that lives there from what? You're supposed to be doing no harm, living in balance with nature. What do you need protecting from that you need a bouncer, that you need a bully boy to intimidate people physically with. That guy threatened physical violence as well as verbal abuse. But that is the first glimpse that a lot of people have had of what Mark McMurtry's bouncer does look like. So this is the guy that gets talked about a lot. Now we know what he looks like. Everybody knows what he looks like and what he's like. And that is a benefit that if you see someone like that man coming towards you, he doesn't keep very good company. No, people like that are bullies. They bully people. There's no negotiating or talking, but then the only people that actually are willing to negotiate and talk are those that have got nothing to hide or actually think that if they do have something to hide that they'll do a good job of pretending the sales pitch is reality. That's why on shows like A Current Affair there's a lot of them that simply we ask them, you know, the other side to respond and we got no comments. Well, of course they're not going to comment. Now, one of the things that they can't even comment on is <laughs> what is Derek Zillman's role in this development? Why, why is he in charge? Just what's your job title, Derek Zillman? It's a simple question. But even that's enough to stir up a little bit of threat here and there. As I've seen it from an email that someone sent to me, 
that they received from somebody. <laughs> yeah, you're backing up the wrong tree. I think you, you're confusing me with somebody else or that we're the same, but never mind, you'll figure it out. Derek. So, I sort of can't wait for the sequel. Maybe that might involve Pete Evans and his involvement with Nightcap, the OSTF and GAP, MOU. I mean, he is, after all, now a um, senator or trying to be a senator with the Great Australia Party. And, oh, look, Rodney Cullerton, he's also an undischarged bankrupt. So, Pete Evans... Like Mark McMurtry, they like to do business with bankrupts. Hmm. Wonder why that is. And I wonder why you would have such faith in someone that can't manage their own affairs that you would think that they could manage other people's affairs. Why you would even get into business with a bankrupt. Oh, but he only became a bankrupt because the system was against him. Yeah, conspiracy theory stuff fake news stuff. Actually, Pete Evans is full of more fake news <laughs> than what Rodney Cullerton refers to as the lamestream media. Actually, the mainstream media can get a hold of more truth than what Pete Evans can actually manage to grasp in between those two ears of his. Because even they can figure out what do no harm means. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to say, catch you next time. Bye.